It's Sunday, September 27th, and welcome back to The McSpencer Group. We are not subject to judicial review. I'm joined today by Mark Brahman. Main topic, America's Sanhedrin. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has died, and the notorious RBG is set to be replaced by the glorious ACB, jurist Amy Coney Barrett. Barrett's nomination will no doubt send many into hysterics, and the affair will be enveloped in dirty tricks, smear campaigns, and intrigue. But before we crank out the popcorn, it's important to take a step back and examine the true nature of the Supreme Court. What does this institution, a priestly order of conformist yet immensely powerful midwits, tell us about the nature of the American government and who exactly is in control? All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, Mark is along with me on this one, and I think you'll see why shortly. Mark, how are you? I'm doing well. Uh, thank you for inviting me on. Mm -hmm. You kind of are reluctant to come on this because you feel like you're not following. <laughs> could, could you detect that? <laughs> <laughs> you're like, okay, if you want to, we can do a podcast. I mean, if you want to, I mean, I, no, yeah. no, no, I, I'm always happy to do a podcast. I just, I, I just hope that I'm, uh, you know, I can, I can, um, contribute something valuable. You I think will. We, yeah. I think we will. Yeah, once we... The, the, this is the thing. Um, I think you were a little bit timid to go on here because you're not following day-to-day -day politics and, and I'm not following day-to-day -day politics in the way that many people are who are true junkies. Um, but I, I'm following it enough to understand what's going on. And I think what we can add is different than what other people can add. If for other people, this stuff is their life and they can give you the ins and outs and who said what, and you know, uh, who's screwing whom and, all these, you know, nuances and rumors and whatever. I think we just want to kind of just take a stand back from that and look at what's really happening with this. And then also, I, I think even more importantly, look at how battles over the Supreme Court are are indicative of this just kind of flawed, fundamentally flawed American system. At least that's my take on this matter. Um, but let's go. I don't think I need to catch everyone up to speed too much on the Ginsburg situation. Um, so Ruth Bader Ginsburg, God rest her soul, she has passed. Uh, she is now lying in state um, in the U.S. Capitol. And she was one of the nine Supreme Court justices. Uh, so there are um, three branches of government a uh, legal judicial branch, the Supreme Court on top, the court that has the final say on, uh, you know, ma many legal cases, but uh, I think their, their real power is in what's called judicial review. Uh, that is their ability to judge whether a piece of legislation is, in their eyes, constitutional um, then there, of course, is a uh, legislative, the congressional branch that where laws are initiated. And there is, of course, the executive branch, the president, the man who executes the law, the um, kind of uh, bureaucratic system that gets it done. And um, this is supposedly, from what we've been told, in middle school, this is supposedly just a brilliant apparatus, couldn't be perfected on, uh, amazing uh, uh, mechanism of checks and balances where uh, no branch becomes too powerful and the other branches can um, overrule it. Well, I think that's a lot of hokum, but I think we'll get to that a little bit later. But there are some interesting politics about this. And um, so, just four years ago, uh, Antonin Scalia, who was a famous conservative judge, uh, you could say libertarian in some ways, but also was uh, someone who w was integral in the conception of a uh, the kind of unitary conception of a um, of an executive, and certainly was integral in granting George W. Bush war powers and so on. 
Uh, he was also a big Catholic. Um, we have we are in a situation um, where. Uh, I think it's six to three uh, of Catholics and Jews. There is not a wasp on the Supreme Court. Uh, so we this remarkable trend will continue. Um, and uh, I don't know if we have anything to say about that. I don't I don't even quite know what to make of it, to be honest. Uh, other than the uh, there does seem to be a tend I mean, the 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 Jewish, interest in law and 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 just basically being high IQ and successful and so on that that doesn't terribly surprise me that Jews are overrepresented uh, the Catholic aspect is interesting I think it probably has something to do with the um, this Catholicism that infects the conservative movement which um, really ever since the mid-century in William F Buckley has has been to a very large degree a Jewish and Catholic movement um, there were kind of older versions of the right um, uh, previous to National Review and so on, but um, it, it is, it, it's definitely a it's kind of Catholic tinged um, American conservatism that has won out and that has, is still winning out to a very large degree. It's remarkable. Uh, I don't quite know what that means about Catholics, but it probably doesn't mean anything good. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> to be yeah, honest, and I, I, and I don't, I don't think that that's very threatening either. The fact that there are, or, or to the sort of the current establishment, the fact that there are two Jews on there, or even one Jew on there, it's, mm -hmm. it's and the rest Catholics yeah. is just pretty meaningless. And yeah. I mean, at this point, if there were, if it were eight wasps and one Jew, it, it would be pretty meaningless, right? It operates on the basis of consensus and precedent. And the, you know, the Supreme Court on so many issues will just slowly edge their way towards something. If if the major if the overwhelming majority and elite opinion believes that a runaway slave must be <laughs> who gets to the north must be arrested and returned to his master the supreme court will determine that that is in the constitution somewhere uh in 2020 the supreme court will discover that um uh transsexual rights are part of uh the civil rights movement uh ginsburg actually had a famous decision on um uh marriage uh, and she actually put this, you know, mar marriage has traditionally been, um, you know, it, w with a, uh, it has been about a um, dominant male and subordinate female. And now we're moving beyond that. And this is all part of the Constitution and this, you know, check that we haven't yet cashed at the basis of American history, which is this, you know, dream of equality, this injunction towards equality that we're inching ever closer towards. Um, so, I mean, the the whole legal profession again is a kind of it's like the ultimate midwit profession <laughs> it's about being smart you do your homework you cite your work you uh you know uh, uh use evidence to support a case etc an argument uh but it it's ultimately just kind of slowly moving with the tide of elite and majority opinion and just kind of you know, use interpreting this text and kind of digging something out. Uh, and I would say this for both sides. This is not a, um, a uh, you know, a, a, an insult towards liberal jurist or whatever. It's, it's pretty much the entire profession. Um, but anyway, I, there's, you know, there, there have been some, uh, uh, so, some, you know, a, a tumult going on. I don't know if we need to go into this too deeply, but uh, after Antonin Scalia died in 2016, um, the Republicans were in charge of the Senate. Um, they actually increased that lead in 2018, but they were in charge in 20, um, 2016. And they made up this precedent. Of, I mean, I, I guess it's kind of a rule, but it's just a thing they did that uh, President Obama nominated Merrick Garland, um, who are Merritt or Merrick, I can't remember, Garland. Uh, and from what I've read, he's, a, a, you know, a liberal jurist, but, you know, kind of a neocon as well. I mean, you know, what's really the huge difference here? He was by no means some like left wing fanatic. Um, and he's the kind of person that I, you know, wouldn't be surprised if if conservatives liked on many issues. Uh, but they decided they wanted their own guy in there and they made up this justification of we won't do that. 
um, in, in a lame duck term of a presidency, then the American people have to decide, which again, you know, fair enough, but th that's really not what the court is about on its own terms. The court is about not letting <laughs> democratic opinion decide anything. It's about uh, look, you know, just, you know, uh, overruling or overseeing legislation to see if it's constitutional or not. So, I mean, the whole thing was, was bullshit. I mean, they did it for political reasons and, uh, you know, might as well just admit it. And then now we get to this point where we have a, you know, all but identical situation, uh, in which a justice dies and they are not waiting. And a lot of people thought they were going to, in their words, cuck, um, and not, you know, follow the rules. And Lindsey Graham would be like, well, God, you know, dag damn it. I said I wouldn't do this in four years. And well, I won't. Uh, but no, they they are just simply going to go forward with it. They have the votes in, to, um, uh, to endorse or, or confirm uh, anyone that Trump nominates. And um, I, I think they're going to do it um, unless there's, you know, some new drama that occurs. Uh, they're going to do it. Um, I, I don't even know quite what this means. I, I don't I, I don't know. I mean, uh, whether they're going to overturn Roe v. Wade or or all of this stuff, I maybe um, I, I think that would create a situation that is somewhat similar to where we are now, where abortion is available across the country. I mean, I can't imagine that most states would make abortion illegal. Um, but there would be some states that would, and we saw, we saw a, a battle, I think it was in 2019 in which Alabama made some strong noise, uh, about making, uh, abortion effectively legal in, in all, but a, a few circumstances. Um, but you know, right now in many of these states, um, access to abortion is very difficult. And many of these state legislatures have, you know, kind of effectively, uh, banned abortion to a large degree, if not totally. Um, but it is not illegal. So I, I think, you know, we would probably, even if they overturned Roe and the Federalist Society were, you know, slapping each other in the back and breaking out the champagne and, you know, Mitt Romney, I guess, would crank out a Diet Coke or <laughs> something, go wild. <laughs> um, I don't think anything would change that dramatically. Uh, but go ahead. Yeah, no, it, it goes to like um, the sort of the old debate in the uh, alt right or the uh, dissident right or whatever we're calling it now. But back when it was called the alt right, that was uh, one of the debates: is uh, is abortion even a bad thing? Like having abortion available is is that ultimately a bad thing? And there is some evidence that it's had a dare I say eugenic effect right. uh, to one degree or another. And it's kind of disproportionately affected certain um, disadvantaged populations, you could say, that, um, uh, you know, that uh, probably our, our society is in better shape now um, as a consequence of abortions being legal in a lot of ways, yeah. right? Um, so, Particularly the South. Yes. Ironically, the Republican Party, <laughs> they run on abortion every year, uh, but then they, uh, they might be outvoted if abortion weren't available. <laughs> I mean, it's a weird thing. Um, I mean, it's a a, it seems like it's a religious question ultimately, too, as well. Um, but even there, things are ambiguous because sure. the Southern Baptist Convention in 1973 endorsed the Roe decision. And they said, um, we, you know, we understand a right to privacy and we're not going to fight this issue. Uh, and it was really the development of the religious right and particularly a Catholic led religious right, weirdly, at least intellectually led religious right, that they adopted this issue in the late 70s. And then by the 80s, they had turned it into this hot button issue that it is today, um, in which um, I, I think George Herbert Walker Bush was uh, pro-choice in 1980 or something like that. And then he changed. I can't remember the exact details. Uh, similar uh, story with Reagan. Uh, and but by the 90s, to be a pro choice, like an, a openly, uh, you know, I support a woman's right to choose Republican was very difficult. And by the, you know, W years, those people were exceedingly rare. Um, I think a lot of people probably have, you know, 
ambivalent views on this, like you and I do, uh, of, you know, well, it's not something I like, but to make it illegal is almost worse than um, having it, um, you know, exist right now. And we're just going to kind of, you know, not address this issue. Abortions have been going down um, due to a number of factors, due to the fact that people are having less sex, which is also kind of sad. <laughs> yeah, I, you can, and you can Teen actually- pregnancies are going down? Yeah, go ahead. You can make an argument for, um, uh, or rather against abortion uh, from a racialist position in the sense that- sure. Yeah, I mean, if because really what we're concerned with ostensibly is white births. So if there are no abortions, more white people will be born. And it doesn't really right. kind of matter how many non-whites are born, for example. Right. They, you know, so I, you you, I, you can make that argument. Um, yeah. I, I don't really, I, I share your ambivalence. I don't have a, I mean, the problem, is, the real problem with the society is the society doesn't have a kind of direction it does have a direction, but it doesn't have a desirable direction from our position, right? So all this stuff is sort of kind of random. And it's not like it's not kind of, um, it, you know, these policies are not directed toward a goal. They're just sort of policies um, right. that are part of this generally bad direction um, that both parties are moving in. Yeah. And I, I in terms of abortion, I mean, I, I think that you you could definitely, you could make a racialist case for to be pro life, no question. Uh, you could definitely make a traditionalist case in the sense of, um, you know, first off, on on based on a notion, e even if you made if you made a mistake or something bad happened to you, um, it, you know, the, the child did not make that mistake, and so you you are punishing him for you know a, 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 under your own discretion uh, for something that he has no control over and and that that's a reasonable argument um you could also say that you could make a kind of rad trad uh, argument and say that all these women out there are uh, they you know they're they're aborting their babies left and right and get, you know going into careers and if only you know if only we made that illegal then they'd stay home and have you know productive families and so on i'm not sure i buy any of that <laughs> though um I, I I think the the kind of higher IQ the the kind of women that we would want to have children to be frank uh, I think are fairly good at using contraception and avoiding things like you know getting raped or knocked up you know by an unknown man or or, or what have you uh, they avoid those kinds of things um, much like they generally take care of themselves throughout the, their own their entire lives and they kind of live in bubbles. Um, to a large degree, so I, I I think the the types of people who are 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 having abortion are not those career gals that you think of. It's it's something very different. And um, I I don't know. I, I I think these these women. I mean, I'm sorry to be just totally brutal and you know Malthusian or something here, but um, those women who are bragging about their abortions and you know, like, yeah, I had a an abortion and I'm proud or so on. I'm I'm not exactly that, that saddened by the notion that those types of people are not reproducing. You know, I mean, the, it, I, you know, it's one thing to for this to have happened to you and for you to kind of make a tragic choice or something. Uh, it's another to make that part of your identity and think it's wonderful and not see that you are, you know, ending life. And um, I don't know. I, I, I think the, the, the kind of spiteful mutant thesis uh, seems to apply here. The, these are, are really bizarre people, and they have uh, really profoundly disordered minds. And um, they're going to pass on those kinds of things if they have children. I mean, I know this is kind of brutal, but um, Ed was even talking to me a little while ago about um, this irony of banning abortions in Ireland, where uh, you now have these, you know, ridiculous governments in charge. And, um, you know, how many of those spiteful mutants might not be walking amongst us if abortion were legal in Ireland? A not insignificant amount. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't disagree. I mean, to some, I mean, there is a kind of, there's a genetic question with some of these people. 
Um, but there's also a, a cultural, a larger, broader yeah. cultural question where to one extent or another, everyone is sort of suffering from a kind of mass uh, psychosis, as it were, right? Uh, mm -hmm. In the sense that, you know, sort of the ideas that we hold um, are, I, you know, you and I believe them to be very sound and rational and fair and humane ideas, um, but they're they're sort of roundly uh, villainized by just about everyone else, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's that. And um, so some of these people, uh, some of these mutants, as it were, might have been relatively healthy psychological people under different uh, cultural conditions, as it were. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Um, well, anyway, I don't, I, and I'm, I'm a little bit ambivalent myself. I won't make a strong prediction. If this um, justice gets in, whether they will overturn Roe or not, I'm curious about that. I, I could see someone like Roberts going the other way, but I would say this, that even if it were overturned, um, again, I, I think effectively we would be in a very similar situation where we are today. And where we are today is where abortion, access to abortion is, is quite difficult in many states. And it is legal and available uh, and safe, you know, in most areas of the country. And I think actually it would just remain like that if, if Roe were overturned. And this is one of those things with the conservative movement. I mean, how many billions have been dedicated to the Federalist Society and, you know, grooming all of these, you know, potential Supreme Court justices? You know, we've got to get our man in the White House so we can appoint this judge to overturn Roe. And, and you do it and you're kind of ruined by your success in the sense of like, well, Nothing's really changed, actually. We haven't fundamentally changed. We haven't won the culture war. We haven't fundamentally changed the environment by doing this. And I, I think this is, again, one of those kind of conservative false victories, if they do get it. And they might. I think it's actually reasonable to say that uh, if Trump wins um, a second, well, if Trump appoints a justice and if Trump, say, wins or for some other reason, the conservatives are kind of you know, feeling themselves and they bring up a case that would directly affect Roe. Um, it is very possible that that could happen. But what I really wanted to talk about um, and why I wanted to have you on is, is the kind of like, what is the Supreme Court? What is this thing that is, has so much power and that we, you know, how many votes do the Republicans get every year just on that basis of the po the possibility that they could appoint a justice? One of these nine, nine humans have this much power and they're uh, appointed by political parties, but they're kind of nonpartisan, at least, at least ostensibly. Um, what does this kind of situation, um, and their, their, you know, their job is not to actually make political decisions and make policy. Even the most liberal justice won't, will say, we're not here to make policy, even though they have had tremendous effect on actual policy. But, um, you know, what does this kind of situation remind you of and, and how is it problematic? And I, you know, I was thinking about this, um, the other night of, of, you know, who is sovereign in the United States? And and I'm using a, you know, Schmidtian conception of that in the sense of who ultimately decides, who in exceptional matters decides, who kind of makes the rules and breaks the rules and doesn't just follow the rules. And in the United States, unlike, say, Prussia or a, you know, a, a tribe in Africa or something, um, this actually is uh, dubious. It's in dispute. We don't quite know. I think if you ask the average, your average Joe on the street, who's in charge, he would say the president. Well, that's not exactly correct. If you look at the actual mechanism of government. So the, the all legislation that is all laws originate and are initiated by the Congress. And so the president doesn't actually have an agenda or a group, you know, a, a, a big host of laws. He might talk about those things, but those aren't ultimately his. And those come from Congress. He has the ability to veto them, which is a kind of kingly like ability. Um, I believe the uh, 
queen still has that ability in parliament, doesn't she? And the parliament still kind of is, is almost kind of confirmed by the queen. And um, she, she can veto legislation, although she doesn't use that power. Well, the president does use that power and the president can veto a law. So you could say he's sovereign, but uh, Congress can override a veto. So Congress can just say, no, we're doing this to the president. So the president really isn't in charge. The president is the ex executor of laws. He's, the, he's not a lawgiver. Uh, he's a law enforcer. And the lawgiver in, in that kind of you know, traditionalist sense is the Congress. Um, in terms of war making and foreign policy, the president has a great deal of power. Uh, it's, he is the commander in chief of the military. Uh, you know, as the executive. Um, so a non military usually a non-military person is in charge of the military. Of course, Washington was a military person and other examples, Eisenhower, retired officer, but a, a civilian is in charge of the military. Um, and particularly in the 20th century, the president has had a great deal of just unilateral power. I mean, the last time, I mean, Congress um uh, uh, <laughs> apparently congress is supposed to be the one declaring war but that actually hasn't happened since the second world war and in between that we've had situations like the korean war in which that war was authorized by the united nations uh and truman executed it so that that was a kind of tossing over or move, move, tossing sovereignty over to another entity Although I've not seen anything, or we've seen a few instances like it. We haven't seen anything on that scale like it uh, since. Uh, what usually happens is that um, Congress passes the buck and the president engages in foreign policy adventures. The president does have powers to engage in adventures with some oversight, but to engage in adventures on his own, particularly in an emergency. So the president is largely sovereign. The, the Senate will... Um, uh, I think they can confirm treaties and and diplomacy, basically. But the you know we we know that the president does have that charge. But at the same time, I think you could make a very good case that the Supreme Court is the sovereign entity in the United States. And the reason I would say that is that while a presidential veto can be overridden by democratic means, um. A, a a SCOTUS decision cannot, and the since uh, Marbury Madison um, in like 1803, uh, so very shortly after the Constitution was ratified and the Articles of Declar Articles of um, Confederation were um, nullified, uh, the Supreme Court has had the ability, at least they don't always use it, but they have the ability to simply say no to any legislation and say this is not con constitutional. And as we know, um, times change, opinions change, the elites change, and decisions change. And precedent, you know, the, the, it's kind of like groupthink, uh, where everyone's just battling to, to, to cover their ass effectively and not be the one who tries to change the paradigm. But then once the paradigm changes, they kind of all get in line with it. And the Supreme Court is like, like that. But the Supreme Court has judicial review. They can just veto a law effectively. And also, as we've seen in um, the year 2000 and other times, uh, the Supreme Court can, I mean, again, I, these are exceptional cases, but again, it's the exception that proves who's sovereign. The Supreme Court basically can has been known to determine who becomes president. I mean, you could really strongly argue that uh, if, if the Supreme Court had been made up in a different manner, that Al Gore would have been president in 2000. And probably not much would have changed, to be honest. I'm not even sure, you know, our destiny would go a different way, but that they had that power. Actually, uh, Justice Ginsburg herself dissented in that uh, decision, uh, Bush v. Gore, uh, in which they, I, I, if I'm remembering correctly, they cut off they cut off the manual recount in Florida, and Bush was president. Boom, rubber stamp. And so the Supreme Court ultimately has power over uh, the president, and thus war making and foreign policy making uh, decisions. E even though they don't always use it, they do have that power. And so you could strongly argue that the Supreme Court is sovereign. And so what does that mean? That means that 
we don't have a sovereign entity who is either you know has has that by right or birth or or by democratic will uh we have a sovereign entity at the very highest level that is a, a bunch of lawyers <laughs> arguing about this text and they are a priestly class and they dress like it uh in these big black gowns that are solemn uh but are highly reminiscent of priest and they are their holy book is the constitution and much like any good priest you can kind of read what you want within reason to the constitution that they are engaged in exegesis. And this is what the justices will all say, whether they're liberal or conservative. They'll say, I'm not the batter here, and I'm not the pitcher. I'm the umpire. I call balls and strikes. And But that, that's kind of the story they tell about themselves. In reality, even though they do it kind of in exceptional instances and they do it glacially slowly, they change policy. They, they, are, they, they aren't law givers but they're kind of law interpretists. They fetishize this holy text from years ago that is called the Constitution in this sense. And so we have a kind of priestly order at the very top of American government. And it's not quite the deep state. It's not the military industrial con um, complex. It's not big finance. But to underestimate its power is pure folly. It is extremely powerful. And just the fact that that is considered a branch of government and the fact that we have this priestly order um, you know, at the very top of American government, I, I actually believe is, is extremely problematic from our standpoint. Um, and I think it also kind of reveals something about the nature of American government. Yeah, well... <clears throat> I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, you know, I think that uh, there is, and uh, maybe you had the intention of me bringing up this uh, parable in the Hebrew Bible, but <laughs> one of the uh, one of the ways it seems that Yahweh triumphs over other gods or false idols in the Hebrew Bible is the scene at uh, Sinai where. Um, uh, Aaron has, you know, melted all these golden rings into a uh, false idol, a golden, the golden calf, right? The mm -hmm. famous golden calf. Now, I, I argue that that is that represents a kind of Aryan um, figure, right? It's or at least at the very least, obviously, it represents a non-Jewish idol, right? Right. So, it in the gold sig may signify a kind of solar identity and Aryan identity. So, this golden calf has been erected, but it's it's. Uh, overturned or usurped um, by these laws, effectively, right? Because what ultimately replaces the golden calf? It's the Ten Commandments that are brought down mm -hmm. uh, from the mountain, and I, I argue that that is that parable exists uh, to show that law is a kind of will to power, right? Mm -hmm. so in other words, if you if you have a people. Uh, who have these sort of tribal gods and are worshiping ancestor, ancestors, for example, or it's a kind of ancestor worship, you know, that, that, that was going on in a relatively healthy way in this country. Uh, I, I'm not going to say until recently, I mean, it's been a kind of slow and steady decline, but we've seen all these kind of idols very explicitly knocked over recently in our country that the, whether they're civil war monuments or whatever the case may be. Um, and so it's a similar thing that's happening in the sense that, and Solzhenitsyn talks about this too, this legalism, the danger of legalism, but mm -hmm. law becomes a kind of will to power. And I think that Jews identify it as a will to power. And that is the meaning of that parable is that they understand it as a way of usurping uh, these tribal gods or these ancestors, which is probably a kind of uh, a more generic and easier way to understanding it, understand it. It's a way of, of uh, basically disrupting the tribal uh, identity of the goyim, as it were, right? Or it, it's a way in, right? It's a way mm -hmm. to, it's a way to assert this uh, invisible God Yahweh as the God of Israel, right? Because that's what's happening in that parable. Um, so it's a will to power, effectively, and it's a will to power um, that is especially one that is um, uh, that Jews are able to. Um, 
use uh, because it's kind of it fits their skill set, as it were, uh, in a very uh, close way. Um, because they're very verbally gifted people, and they're right. they're the people of the book, right? And they're the people of the the Talmud, and they're the people of like sort of making these fine distinctions in laws. That word, uh, that adjective, uh, Talmudic is a reference to making these parsing fine distinctions, right? Um, and so they are in a, you might even argue that they're in a way a kind of a race of lawyers to some extent mm -hmm. or another, right? Um, so that that is a kind of advantage to them. I, I mean, I think that the there are a number of ways that the pagan religion, you know, from my analysis appears to address problems like this. And one of them was uh, the concept of uh, nomos, in Greece, mm -hmm. which means law. Nomos means Greece. Mm -hmm. But they Nomos was also a god, right? So the Nomos was also this god named Nomos, right? Mm -hmm. But the no, Nomos was also Jupiter. Like he was a form of Jupiter or Zeus, mm -hmm. right? So you couldn't, so already the law has a kind of racial ancestral character where, mm -hmm. you know, in Zeus is even in, in the Hebrew, uh, the words for Zeus mean justice, right? So he's a god of justice and he's a judge in, on some level, right? Um, and so the whole character, and we talk about the spirit of the law. I mean, literally the spirit of the law is this kind of homage to this ancestral, you know, Jupiter, uh, who is a kind of avatar, who is exactly a kind of avatar of, you know, Aryans or the white race. Um, so, I think that that is a kind of helpful uh, mechanism that they developed in uh, in the ancient world. Um, and then nomos became an idea that was discussed by the sophists in Greece, right? So you see mm -hmm. how th this it becomes undermined eventually um, and how, you know, through uh, philosophy is one way. But these things, these these sort of religious structures that the ancients developed, they had, you know, they, these problems, they had already encountered these problems and these were some of the solutions uh, they came up with is what I would argue. And yeah. I, I, I would give you one more example of this, which is, I think is, a, is it's an even better example. Well, you have Apollo, who's the god of truth, right? So on some level, Apollo represents truth. And what is Apollo? He's the Hyperborean. He's a symbol of the Aryan race. So truth becomes synonymous with, sort of, I would argue, with racial survival and racial success. So e even the definition of truth itself Right. So when Pilate in the New Testament, in that famous line in the New Testament, when he says, what is truth? Right. I think that that's also signaling that like the Romans had basically lost a sense of truth. Mm. They had lost what truth is. There's another deity uh, that the Romans worshipped called uh, Veritas. Her mm. name is Veritas, and which means truth in Rome, uh, in Latin, rather. It means in, it meant mm -hmm. truth in ancient Rome. And um, she was understood as either descended from Jupiter, which would make her a daughter of Jupiter, right? Um, or she's descended of Saturn, right? Who is a, a Semitic God, right? And that's a kind of important distinction distinction because it, it reveals that there are actually kind of two different truths in the sense that, uh, and they're, you know, I think you understand what I'm saying, but the idea that truth becomes emb embodied in, in effectively something that represents a kind of racial ideal or type gives us a direction or gives us a, an actual kind of uh, palpable and tangible notion as to what truth is. You know, a truth is survival. It's continuance. It's yeah. it's our race. Truth is our race, right? The health of the people is the supreme law. Yeah. It's a Roman concept as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I, there, there's just nothing you like you. I don't know. I mean, we I think we, this this came about in an, an, an th that sentiment came about. Uh, about 20 years ago and in a somewhat unfortunate context of the Iraq war and, and, and nine 11, all that kind of stuff. But the, the constitution is not a suicide pact, <laughs> which uh, it, you know, was declared by, uh, you know, a bunch of conservatives who wanted to go to war in Iraq, but just because they declared it uh, doesn't mean it's the sentiment itself is actually wrong. And of course, any good sentiment can be abused and misused. Of course. Uh, but that basic notion that there is no law above our survival and our flourishing, just simply put, um, I don't think that is a 
that's not a Judaic sentiment or a Christian sentiment. I mean, in the sense that there are laws above your survival. And in fact, you even if you do not survive, if you are go extinct, those laws will remain. Uh, it is a kind of reversal of the way that a Roman would understand these things. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I mean, though, I think that, um, you know, I mean, obviously they, I think that they have intelligently have a kind of cynical way. I mean, cynical is one way of uh, thinking of it, but they have a sort of practical and realistic way of looking at some of these, um, these constructs that we often lose sight of. Right. Yeah. So people, there is this whole cult around the constitution, for example. Right. right. I mean, that, that's a common, and those are some of the most con ostensibly conservative people in the country are these constitutionalists. Right. But so you see exactly what's happening. I mean, they, they basically accepted the, the two tablets from Moses and they're worshiping this, the law as it were. Yeah. Right. Well, it's, it's like a lot of, uh, many people are proud of the so-called separation of church and state, which isn't quite constitutional. I mean, there, there are, um, uh, laws about establishing a national church and so on. I, I think the separation of church and state might come from a letter of Thomas Jefferson, if I'm not, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but this, you know, there, there shall be no established national church. And, that, and that's, you know, understandable. You're creating a new country. There are, you know, there are Quakers, there are Puritans, there are some Catholics, there are some Jews around. I mean, you, you, we're not going to have one national church. Um, again, an understandable sentiment. Um, but I think it's taken in this in this false way, which is that religion and the state should always be separate. And that is an anti-traditionalist view. But I, I think beyond that, I, I think it's a anti-human view. Um, religion and your national order are always going to be combined. And you know, these goofy conservatives, as much as we want to make fun of them, who kind of, you know, talk about God and country and, you know, uh, Jesus and the Constitution, all that kind of stuff. I mean, OK, we can smirk a bit at that, but uh, they are getting at a fundamental traditionalist worldview, which is that the state and the religion are one and they reinforce each other. And God is on your side and you, your people as articulated by the state will triumph with God on your side. And that actually is a natural and healthy view. That is the view of all humans <laughs> up until fairly recently. So uh, it is an evolved view, you could say. Uh, but then I, I would say that the, the whole doctrine of the separation of church and state is a false one. And you hear this from both sides. So even I remember it was Rick Santorum was saying that, you know, um, you know, combining, church and state is bad for the state, but it's also bad for religion. You know, we need to have our own kind of private personal God and sphere of, of religion. But I, I think that is a naive view. Um, we, we don't have a separation of church and state. We simply have a different type of church within our state. And that church is um, you know, diametrically opposed to previous ways of doing things in Europe, and it is basically creating this, um, you know, Judaic textual exegesis system uh, in which the constitution are the stone tablets or the holy book, and we have these priestly midwits interpreting it for us, and they have the final say. So on, on one level, we live in a theocracy. But it is a theocracy of the Constitution, of you know, natural rights and enlightened humanism, you could say. But that is how our system fundamentally functions. And we, and we have to understand it on that basis and not just go in for the slogans of, you know, oh, well, we have separation of church and state in this country or something. We don't. And we yeah, never I mean, have. Yeah. You know, I mean, it actually reminds me of, of something, too, is that. Um, you're right. I mean, politics are effectively religion, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and or they're part of this sort of larger kind of religious culture, as it were. Um, and they're they're uh, they're um, indistinct from it, so they're just part of that fabric. Um, you know, one one sort of uh, comparison that comes to mind is that in Greece, um, 
when the Athenian theater developed, it was a kind of break from earlier cults, right? Because it, it evolved <clears throat> from a cult. It, it evolved mm -hmm. from like these, um, uh, you know, these dying and rising cults. Like, and, and in fact, the, the Dionysian uh, cult. Yeah, yeah. It's, it was called the Dionysia. So mm -hmm. it was a, it was a form of worshiping Dionysus, right? But what happened though, is that religion changed on some level with the development of the Athenian theater. It became in some way less formal and less serious, but mm -hmm. simultaneously, it also became more cunning and more enthralling, mm. right? Um, in the sense that people, people ostensibly were not taking it as seriously as they would take a, you know, an earlier a religious cult or a religious initiation. But I don't think that's the case. I think that they were as enthralled as we see in the media today. We see in Hollywood, for example, uh, which I think is a kind of continuation of the Dionysia. We see a similar kind of cult thing happening where we have people who are uh, who are getting their sort of morals and their, their identity from these TV shows they watch, right? Mm -hmm. These are the parables that kind of inform them morally. Right, I think that that's very clear. So the idea of the cat lady with you know the bottle of wine, watching you know whatever her favorite TV show is, she's being sort of taught what to think about everything effectively mm -hmm. by watching those TV shows. So that becomes a kind of more cunning and effective way of religion than a person going to church where it's kind of explicit, like a you know you have to listen to these commandments. It doesn't doesn't it kind of appeal to the vanity in the same way that entertainment does. Yeah. Right, where in the sense that they don't feel like they're being told what to think, but they are being told what to think. Right, so, and and I think that that, so I think you can draw a similar comparison to politics in the sense that, you know, sensibly there is this division between uh, uh, church and politics, but there isn't. There, it's mm -hmm. you know the culture is kind of woven into one sort of a larger cult, as it were. Yeah, um, and the Supreme Court justices will go with the flow. You know, they'll go with the flow of academia, um, you know, famously in um, desegregation cases, uh, they were calling upon, you know, the latest in social science and, you know, how black children are, uh, they prefer a white baby doll or something. I, I think that's what it was. It was a footnote, but it, it was, they were clearly justifying, um, you know, judicial decisions on the basis of um, elite academia. And they they just kind of go with the flow of the larger church, and they will you know th they will determine these things. And I guess the alternative, because again we're just complaining about something, but um, the alternative I, I I would say it is an executive who can take responsibility for his actions, a an executive who will ultimately wear his power on his sleeve. And, you know, this is, again, someone who would be demonized as, you know, a dictator or, or whatever, uh, but someone who ultimately has to take responsibility for decisions and does not claim that he's acting on the basis of some holy text or some new interpretation that he's, he's come up with, uh, but someone who simply acts. And um, that is, is a real alternative to this system. And that is the type of system that we have in every other way of life. <laughs> in the military, there isn't a Supreme Court. <laughs> I mean, I mean, there, I guess there kind of is in the actual Supreme Court, but no, there are generals and officers. If your football team is going poorly, the, the coach, whether he's really to blame or not, maybe is, maybe isn't, he, he kind of is symbolically beheaded, so to speak. He leaves. You do this in all forms of uh, corporate society, which are corporations are not democratic institutions. They have to be legal, of course, but they they don't have some, you know, magical priestly class determining what they do. You know, is this new product uh, constitutional or not? No, they just simply act and people have to take responsibility for their actions. Uh, and that is just a more honest way, as particularly as opposed to the American system, where no one takes responsibility <laughs> at some level. And it's all of these, you know, this churn of new representatives, churn of presidents, uh, you know, whether the president is more powerful than, say, the media or the military industrial complex or big finance. 
or the Supreme Court is questionable. And you just have this, this so these so-called checks and balances are just this kind of infinite way to pass the buck and cover your ass. And no one is really in charge, except again, ultimately, this group of midwits like who are interpreting legal documents. And it's just, I, I don't know. I I I mean, I I don't want this to sound too dire, but I I until we can move beyond this kind of thing, I, I don't I'm not sure whether the world we want is really possible because we 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 want a we we don't just want you know white people you know in america like um, you know keep our de- you know demographics 60 percent white that's great let's keep it you know that's not the ultimate end of what we want and we don't just want you know the end of you know anti-white slander in, in hollywood and academia or whatever that's that would be great to end no question but that's not ultimately it i mean we we do want a different way of being a different way of life and that would that would entail learning from the past mistakes of creating a system like this and creating a better one. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I, and I think that that should be our focus. But at the same time, um, there is certainly with even within this system, as kind of fettering as the system is, as you've described, uh, there are opportunities uh, for someone in the position of Donald Trump to cro- to cause a lot of mayhem, which he had yes. he, he sort of failed to do effectively, right? Um, so the, the he caused you know, a lot of hysteria, but he hasn't actually like fundamentally, you know, uh, gone after anything or changed anything fundamentally. Sure, it, yeah, and it's caused set- a lot of heartache and liberal tears, I guess you could say. <laughs> but what you're describing, though, becomes sort of his uh, that becomes his alibi, effectively, like the mm-hmm. system becomes his alibi. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and we still blame him because we don't think that the system, you know, we do actually even within the system, a strong man could, you know, the golden calf could usurp, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, could the usurp tablets. the tablets. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, the I mean, that's in this case. Sh- sure. Um, anything is still possible on the political level. Um, we just, so far, we haven't seen people that are willing to kind of take those steps. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe in some cases it's because of a lack of, uh, sort of, um, profundity, right. Or a sense of history or a sense Mm -hmm. of, um, you know, what are they actually doing? I mean, what is Trump actually doing? What is his legacy going to be? Yeah. Can Um, you stand outside it? I mean, I've, I, I, I've, joked on Twitter, but I, but I, I was serious, you know, you have all of these liberals freaking out about Donald Trump, you know, nullifying the election or some, you know, somehow staying in office and whatever. And, you know, I, they, they see that as like an evil in itself. And whatever. It's fascist, but it's kind of like, okay, let, let's take this thought experiment and ask what, what would he actually do if he did that? My guess is that he'd do the same stupid crap that he's been doing for the past four years, <laughs> that even if he did something that dramatic, and I don't think he will, by the way, but um, even if he did something as dramatic as nullify an election, we just still be in the same position where we are right now, where you know we have these other forces that are more powerful than he is, and, and he can't take a step back and think outside it and and think that there could be something better. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, the, the, we've seen no evidence that he would do anything interesting. Right. Um, I think that, you know, and I actually don't know if we've actually talked about this, but um, I mean, it's just a sort of ongoing phenomena that I'm sure that you've talked about. Maybe we've talked about it offline and I'm sure you've probably mm-hmm. touched on it on uh, other episodes of this show with other uh, guests. But, you know, there is a kind of, uh, and I guess I, um, uh, Dutton makes this point actually that mm-hmm. uh religiosity increases during times of stress, yeah. right? And I think that we've seen that um, in the uh, former alt-right or in the dissident right, where we've seen people like, the, we've seen the rise of the uh, um, the trad casts, for example. Um, no, I mean, it, which I think is an actual kind of real phenomenon, you know? Yeah, and it, it, it makes sense that they're, they're and like a lot of- one, at least kind of at first glance, you know, what's going on here? All these Zoomers adopting Catholicism, what, what, with what's what is that <laughs> sure but it does make sense that there are all yeah. these kind of young kids in the sense that that's a time when people can really be formed or impressed at yeah. a certain point you know at a certain formative 
stage of their life, they can actually be turned in this direction or that. Whereas, I mean, the average person, and I think that there are certainly exceptions, and I think that you and I would count as exceptions to this, is that you and I, I think, have probably changed a lot over our lives. Like we've had mm -hmm. multiple stages of kind of change and growth, as it were. And a mm -hmm. lot of that is a, a, us sort of reacting to our times um, and kind of getting over our times, as it, I would say, mm -hmm. right? And looking, you know, trying to think beyond our times, as it were. Um, but I think that most people are basically fully formed on some level at the age of like 25 or 26. Yeah. Um, this is an idea that actually that a friend uh, gave me, but I think it actually kind of rings true that pe most people are kind of just fully formed and mm -hmm. like in their mid twenties for a number of reasons, you know, they're getting married, their, their career is on its track or whatever the case may mm -hmm. be. And they're just who they are going to be, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think that that, so it makes sense that we see a kind of radical, a religious radicalization at that Zoomer level, you know, and I don't, I, I don't know what the numbers are. I, I suspect it's not even that really that larger percentage of Zoomers that are going in that direction, but. Oh no, not a large percentage yeah. of Zoomers, but it's interesting that it's a large percentage of the alt-right. Yeah. And it, it, it has a, um, it does feel like, it's where uh, the conditions have become medievalized on some level, right? Mm -hmm. Where people are really like, there, it does feel like there's a kind of spiritual desperation, as it were, in the DR, where people are really kind of like looking for something and afraid mm -hmm. of being deceived or whatever the case may be. And um, and so, but it's a it's a real phenomena um, where people are lost, and you know, mm -hmm. it's a kind of it, it's a kind of dark time in a lot of ways. You know, and I think that, that really, I think that the future uh, belongs to those who kind of can keep their, you know, it's sort of like the Kipling poem, those who can yeah. kind of keep their heads, as it were, and remain sober through this kind of crazy period. I mean, it's a, Gibbon describes this as well uh, in uh, uh, the, the, the Decline of Rome. He mm -hmm. describes how um, superstition becomes rife like during this decline period where all these sort of weird cults pop up and people are just kind of going crazy effectively. And I yeah. think that we've seen that in our own lifetime. We've seen this like in the various sort of like sex that even developed, you know, of people that even we know and some people who we like um, are kind of like going in that direction effectively. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Uh, they're becoming more religious as it were and things and what, whether something is true or not, it's it's no longer really the question. It's kind of like, what is going to kind of like take away the pain, as it were, right? What is the opiate that's going to just kind of like make mm -hmm. it go away? And what, can I just kind of fix myself on this thing and just that's it? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so, but because, you know, it's unpleasant to to do what we you and I do, which is kind of walk through the, the valley, the shadow of out or the shadow mm -hmm. of darkness, as it were, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's better to kind of go to sleep, I think, on some level. Yes. Speaking of that, it's getting late. Um, <laughs> thanks for being on. And, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I, I, I hope we were able to get at something. Because, I mean, I, I, I think that's what we can add that others can't, which is that you know, if you want to just follow the horse race, you can go elsewhere. There are people who are better at that than than we are. But if you, if you want to take a step back and think about what's going on, that's what we do. All right. Talk to you soon, Mark. Talk to you soon. Bye.